What's going on, everyone? And welcome back to another episode of the Mountaintop Motivation Podcast. Today, we are here with an incredible seven-figure entrepreneur, Bridget Carroll. How are you doing today, Bridget? Oh my God, I am good. I'm so excited for this conversation. Your energy is so good, so I know it's going to be fun. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm glad that Jake Kelfer uh, introduced us and connected us. Um, because I think that networking is such an important thing, connecting with other people. I'm curious, how much has networking with the right people impacted you and your business and your journey? Oh my gosh. I mean, I just came back from a mastermind where I was spending time with the friend who connected us, Jake, and I was reflecting on that. And it not only improved my network so much from like a, um, expansive way of like, okay, these people are doing it. So can I like being around seven figure entrepreneurs when I was only a multi six figure entrepreneur that helped my bottom line a lot, but what it really helped with. And I think is honestly the most important is that it helped me to feel more grateful in my life. It helped me to feel more excited about business and just really improved my enjoyment. So networking, I think honestly is the thing that allowed me to kill it in my business so quickly, but also to not burn out because I was around people, like-minded people who are doing it as well and had a lot of advice of, you know, Hey, do this. Don't do that. Hey, let's connect on a personal level and not just business. So networking, I think is the number one thing. If you're trying to grow your business to be focusing on. Yeah. I, I like that idea that you shared about, um, how important it is to see people and say, okay, well, if, if they did it, I can do it too. And, and for me, this is a big part of the reason for these interviews is for people to see people and say, okay, if they can do it, then I can too. But it, because I think it, it just becomes so much more possible when you learn their story and learn they're just normal, regular people. Absolutely. And I think there's two different ways to go about that. You see someone crushing it, and you can make it mean two different things about yourself. You can go into comparisonitis mode where you're like, oh, she can or he can, but I can't and come up with all of these limiting beliefs about why you can't or they're saying to yourself, they did, I can too. So it's two different things. It's comparisonitis or they can, I can as well. And for a lot of my clients, what something that I work with them on is that shift because for a lot of women, and I don't know if you see this with, I coach mostly women that mm -hmm. we go into comparisonitis a lot. And my guess would be that's the same for men. It can just be very typical. We see someone killing it that we can as well. So, yeah. um, that shift is really important. I think comparisonitis is my new favorite word. Uh, I had never heard that before. That's a great word. Yeah. I mean, it can, it can be quite the dis, dis, disability for sure. Like the disorder of sorts. So comparisonitis. Yeah. Well, let's, let's get into your story. So I think it's such a cool story that Bridget, you have gone, you, you went from zero to seven figures in 16 months. That's, that's unbelievable. You know, that's something that typically people go level by level by level. What, what do you attribute that quick success to? Oh gosh. I mean, the big things like network is number one and not just like going to my friends who were in business investing in my network. So I invested in three masterminds in my first year and all of the investments for the masterminds were over $20,000. So basically I invested about $60,000 thousand dollars in masterminds alone, literally paying for my friends. That's what I say. Like jokingly yeah. paying for friends, getting into the right rooms. Um, so that that's, that's huge is being around like-minded people, being around people who are higher than you are. And then if you do go into comparison, I just mode making that shift. The second thing would be doing the inner work. So before I hired a business coach, I hired a mindset coach and yes. Yeah. What they really helped me do is like dive into what I wanted to do, what my authentic message was. And we also worked on limiting beliefs that were screwing me or would screw me from reaching my goals. You know, that biatch in the back, I call her the subconscious that really runs the show. 
Yeah. I worked on her a lot with deep hypnosis meditation and um, just the, what I call the inner work was really mm. those two things alone were the biggest things to get me to seven figures in 16 months. That's amazing. Uh, before we go into the specifics of the story, I realize that there's probably all of our listeners saying, awesome, but Bridget, what do you do? So tell <laughs> us about your business. Yeah. So as we stand today, I have three different businesses, but I'll go to the beginning. So I started my business in June, 2020, um, you know, two months into the global pandemic, I was like, I talked with one of my good friends who was a mindset coach. And we realized together through discussion and exploration that I had my quote unquote dream job, but I wasn't happy or fulfilled. Mm, and there and were a couple of it, I made my own um, job within a holistic pharmacy. I was the director of nutrition. Hmm. So I was seeing clients one-to-one. -one. I'm a registered dietitian. That is like my career. Cool. That's what I went to school for eight years for and was seeing one-to-one -one clients at this holistic pharmacy and realized in talking with this mindset coach that I was unfulfilled because of this job. I wasn't getting paid enough. Um, there were two people running the show that really didn't value me. So I was like, all right, peace out. I'm going to start my own business, much yes. to many people's dismay of like- Is it oh June of 2020? June of 2020. So everyone, all of your all of your network, all your friends, all your family are saying, it's June of 2020. You have a job. What are you thinking? Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. And I That's was great. like, yeah. And that was so helpful to like shift my mindset of like, if I'm not fulfilled- it's like almost like this or something better. And right. I knew there was something better and I was going to call my shot. And honestly, that like phrase of like, call your shot is something that has guided me in the right direction every single step of the way. So I started my first business, which was well by Bridget. It was one-to-one -one virtual gut health coaching. Mm. And my first month in business was $42,000. Wow. Like, that's amazing. Yeah. I was like, holy shit. What just happened here? You know, I actually, and truthfully, Jake, I didn't know my numbers until four months later. Wow. I didn't even know that I hit $42,000. I didn't know that I hit six figures in two and a half months. I was just following my alignment of like, what feels really freaking good? How can I really solve people's problems? And I knew I was a G. I knew I was so good as a dietitian in fixing people's gut health issues. Wow. So that's where I started. And I was a gut health coach for about seven months. And then I hired this one business coach, more business strategy coach about my sixth or seventh month in business. And she started asking questions like, do you want to do this forever? You know, you've had so much success as an online business owner in six or seven months, you know, would you want to teach people how to do this? And I was like, yeah, cause it was easy. <laughs> I mean, it was just pretty funny where she was like, I, I hope you realize for some people, this has not been easy. And that's where mm -hmm. I started realizing that my journey was a little bit different that of doing the mindset work, first of listening to my gut and being in full alignment with myself, that that's where I was creating a lot of success. Mm. And so I became a business coach and I joined three more masterminds of people who are doing this and, um, really was good at coaching my business coaching clients of getting into alignment with themselves and using strategies I used, but really asking them, questions so that they could get in alignment with themselves. Mm. What kind of questions help people get in alignment with themselves? Yeah. Oh, like what would feel really good? I think is a great question. Um, when I think of like launch strategy for my clients, um, you know, I think strategy is very, very, very important and it's very important to have, but if it doesn't feel good, if it doesn't feel exciting, if it doesn't feel like a big hell, yeah. And then you go and try and use someone else's strategy that doesn't feel good. The energy behind it is going to be blah. Yeah. You're going to, yeah, you're going to manifest yeah. that it's not going to work because you're not in alignment with it. It's not, 
it doesn't feel good to you. So then when you go to do your launch strategy, the whole time, it's going to feel like pushing a boulder up a hill. Mm. So what would feel good for you? Now, what's an example of, um, what's an example of, I, I, I'm not exactly sure how to ask this question, but what I'm looking at is not everything all the time is super fun. Like, okay, I, I love exercising, <laughs> but I don't love it every day, but like, I still do it every day. So I guess what I'm asking is where's the balance? Where's the balance between, Hey, I, I love this idea. Mm -hmm. And I, I love, where's the balance between I love this and it's bliss and yeah, but I got to do the work, even mm -hmm. though some days it doesn't feel like that. Oh, a thousand percent. And I, I probably, you know, in the last couple of minutes have painted such an altruistic picture, but I think that's the goal is to oh, get right. to a I point. Agree right? Where you're really in your zone of genius. So anything that doesn't feel good, I have my clients either delegate, automate, or delete it. So mm. what allowed me really to hit seven figures so quickly is I'm a master delegator. And mm. I think honestly, for people going from six figures to multi-six figures or multi-six figures, especially to seven figures, I think that transition from having like a 50 K month to having like an hundred K month is delegation mm -hmm. through and through. So I think that if something doesn't feel really good, figuring out like, can you do one of those things? And then of course there's going to be things in their business that really don't feel great, but that's where like, um, really tuning into zone of genius is going to be that seven figure, multi seven figure person who's really yes. just honed in of like, this is what I freaking do so good. Yeah. So much expansion there. That makes so much sense. And, and to be clear, I'm only asking in that way, because as, as the interviewer, I need to play the contrarian for all those who are thinking, Hey, but what if, but what if, but what if, so that, that, that's where the questions are coming from. Cause I, I agree with you. And I, I think I have my definition of what that means to say, if you don't love it, don't do it. But also at the same time, I think that a lot of people give a lot of yeah, buts. And I think if we can take away the yeah, buts, mm -hmm. it's so empowering for them to go, okay, mm -hmm. all my yeah, buts are gone. So now mm -hmm. it's time for me to just go. Mm, yes. And this is something very important to say as well is like, it doesn't mean like, let's say you have an offer, right? Like, let's say you have a group yeah. coaching program and it doesn't feel good. We can make micro adjustments to make it feel amazing. You don't have to say like a lot of my clients come to me. A lot of my clients are multi six figure people and they'll say like, yeah, I just don't want to do one-to-one. -one. And I say, well, is it that you just don't love one-to-one -one or is the way that you're doing it right now, not in alignment? Mm. So for example, some people might be undercharging for one-to-one -one services. Like when I say one-to-one, -one, right. it's just like, you know, me and you on a uh, virtual call. Yeah. Um, so for example, I'll use myself as an example. One-to-one -one was feeling kind of heavy at one point there were a couple of different reasons. One, I had way too many clients. Okay. So it's going to feel out of alignment because I feel like I'm doing too much of it. And two, right. um, I was doing all zoom calls and I switched a lot of my clients to phone calls and then it felt so much better. And my clients <sighs> loved it. I'm so happy that you said that. I'm like, I can't tell you how happy I am that you said that because like, sometimes I like, I like there's, there's all these little things around my desk of things that I play with on calls because I need to be moving. And sometimes for me, I'm so much more creative. If I can walk around, if I can walk around this, I purposely got an office that was big enough that I can, I can walk, like, it's not like it's massive, but it's, it's big enough. I can, I can walk, I can move. I can, I have space in here. And it's like, there's a whole nother space over there. And it's because I love moving. I love being outside. Like sometimes my favorite coaching calls are me sitting on a park bench and talking to someone because I can get in touch with so much more when I'm outside or I'm moving or you know, any of those things. And, and I hear a lot of people say like, no, no, I need to see their body language. I need to see this. And I'm like, 
why? This yeah. is like sometimes the phone is so much better. A thousand percent. I'm so in love with that. So then if you were my client, I'd be like, are you doing that enough? And that's where like, okay, yeah. what, what our clients believe will get them results. No, we are the guide to say, Hey, we're going to try this out and see how it feels. Or the boundary is set. Like, Hey, all of our calls are now one-to-one -one zoom calls. And I think for some of us, or entrepreneurs, phone calls. one to one phone or calls or one, one to one yeah. phone calls. Yeah, exactly. For some of us entrepreneurs, what we don't have great sometimes are boundaries. Yeah. Boundaries with work boundaries with our clients. And that like, that sounds like a pretty small boundary, but I'll tell you some of my clients would be like, well, I could never do that. My clients would be so upset. But what you just said is, holy cow, I get like incredible results when I'm like this. And that makes you more in your zone of yeah. genius. I love, I love doing it on, on that kind of, in that kind of setting. I think it's such a great thing to do them in that setting. I like doing zoom as well, but I, I end up, I guess there's pros and cons to both. Mm -hmm. And I think that the phone call is undervalued in the coaching world. I think yeah. everyone thinks that it has to be a zoom call and there's something about not moving that is challenging for me. I don't know if it's challenging for everyone because everyone's different, mm -hmm. but like I, so my wife was a tutor for a couple of years working with most of the clientele were hyperactive teenage boys, which was mm -hmm. very much me growing up. <laughs> and, um, one of the things that she found, I remember she had this one, this one boy she was working with and this, this boy was having such a hard time, uh, such a hard time with math and, and really focusing on that. And, and, um, this was in an area that was, there was a, um, there was a big Intel, you know, the, the company Intel, the computer company, their big yeah, yeah. plant there in Folsom, California, it was right next to that. So all like, you know, parents were engineers, they're very focused on this and they were not happy with how he was performing. And so I think this boy was like 13 or 14 or something like that. So my wife started doing the, the math homework, but having him stand on one foot as he was doing it, uh, you know, switch back and forth, turn around, walk around in circles and do all these things. And then he was getting it and he was able to do it. And I just, I just think that people, some people are different. We're wired differently. And some of us need that movement or some of us need fresh air or some of us need. And, and I think it's so important as a coach to understand how you can deliver the most value to your clients. Mm -hmm. And that's what matters the most. Absolutely. And then I'd also follow up with that and yourself, Yeah. right? Cause if you are so in your zone and you feel really good, that's where the alignment piece is, right? Like let's take another example of like, if we're not exercising as coaches or we are not eating well, or, or, you know, my two of my three companies focus on gut health. If our gut health or our hormone health is really off, we can't be the best coaches that we can be either. And that affects our bottom line as well. So if we talk about going from zero to seven figures in 16 months, my health came first. My health was on point first health is our wealth. And because I took care of myself a lot of the time, I was able to show up big for my clients. Yeah. Um, in Tony Robbins just came out with a new book called life force. And I did, have, yeah. you, have you looked at it yet? Have you read it yet? <laughs> Yeah. My mentor just gifted it to us last week. So, yeah. okay, cool. I mean, it's like the, the audible is like 22 hours long. So, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a long book. It's a very long book. I'm like halfway through it, but there's a line at the beginning of the book that I thought was so great. Uh, he says, this was like, this wasn't his thing. It was like a, it was some kind of proverb. Someone a long time ago said it, an old person. I don't remember what it was died a long time ago, but what they said was, um, a healthy man has many dreams mm. and an unhealthy man has one. Mm. I thought that was so interesting to think about. Like when you are sick, maybe you said a sick man, you know, I was thinking mm -hmm. about like my brother-in-law has, there, there's a bunch of issues that this one uh, brother-in-law has. And, and I, I told him that quote and he's like, oh my gosh, yes. He's like, I don't care about anything else other than 
getting healthy and, and a lot of it's taken care of now, but he said, when it was in the darkest time and the hardest mm-hmm. time of it, nothing else in my life mattered. And I think that that's a, a really cool thing to think about. We have to put ourselves first and it's not, yes, it is out of, it's important for us and our health, but it's so important. Our success comes from doing those kinds of things. And we see it over and over again. And everyone says it. Why do you think so many entrepreneurs have a hard time doing their exercise, doing their self-work, taking care of themselves, really, you know, putting themselves first. I don't even think of it as putting themselves. First. It's honestly, it's, it's putting your clients first. It's putting your business first. If you can't take mm. care of yourself, you can't do those things. But why do you think so many people have a hard time doing that? Yeah. Well, I can use myself as an example of, you know, putting myself first for almost probably 20 months. You know, we got to 16 months and then 20 months was probably until December, something like that. And then January and February of this year, something shifted. And I can honestly pinpoint for me. And as we're talking about this, I'm like having a huge revelation of we launched a brand new company. I have a gut health supplement company that launched middle of November last year and things were going okay. But what shifted me from putting myself first to putting my three companies first was fear, mm. was lack. So there's two different mindsets we can have as well in business and in life is in, and there's gray area. Of course, there's always gray area, but there's yeah. lack or abundance, right? Lack would be like, I have not, there's never enough coming from mid, the Midwest myself. It was a lot of money lack mindset that mm. I grew up with. In an abundant mindset, it's there's always enough. I have what I need. I'm so grateful for it all. So with launching my new company, uh, Gut Personal, and then moving into the new year, we had staff on my team that it was not working out with. We hired a marketing agency. We hired a COO. None of it was working. And I was in lack that one, they could do their job, which we found out that they truly couldn't. So that's a reality. But two, I was fearful that my business would plummet, that we were launching at one, you know, we have three different companies. We were launching something in all of the companies at once. And so I didn't set myself up for success with strategy. You know, that's one thing. But then also I was so fearful that we would not be successful. And so fear made me take my eyes away, what was truly important and what was my North star, which was my health and gratitude. I love that. I know that there are people listening right now thinking, wait, what do you mean you had fear and lack Mm -hmm. when you already were at that seven figure level? And obviously how silly that is, but that's, that's where people think, you know, we think about if, wait, 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 you can't have problems because you're already here. People think Mm. that reaching that level in your business will just solve all your problems. Can you talk about still experiencing fear, still experiencing lack, even when you reach a new level? I think, oh gosh, this is so good. Something, a huge lesson I've learned with putting myself in the room with people who are higher up than me, they were making more than me. You know, I just came from a mastermind retreat a mastermind that really helped me, Chris Harder. Um, he hosts a mastermind and this year it's a lot of eight figure people, which is really exciting. Yes. And there's this phrase of new levels, new devils. Yes. I love that phrase. It's so good, right? It's my favorite. It's truly the best. And no matter at what level you are, you will have new things to that are going to be new um, challenges. And I think sometimes, especially with the inner work and the mindset work and things like that, which is that fear or lack um, versus abundance is um, where we think that the work is done and the work, the inner work, the belief work is never done. So me being a seven figure person or seven figure business, like what did that solve? And it's nothing emotional. The emotional work and the inner work happens first and then the goals happen. 
So I don't know that I have a great answer, but being in rooms of seven, eight figure people, you know, we just, um, I had the pleasure of being in a room with Mark Fleischman, who is, I think nine figure, if not a billionaire. And he Mm. still has stuff that he works through. So what we can pull from that is that it's almost like a comfort of like, okay, if I get to a new level, there's going to be a new mindset shift that I'm going to have for me right now. And I'll use myself as an example, being a seven figure entrepreneur, I honor that. And I'm so grateful for it. And I want to sell my supplement company for a hundred million dollars or more. That's a nine figure Mm. exit. Right. And so I know that there are going to be huge shifts that I have to make in getting to there. Yes. Mindset shifts, strategy shifts, lifestyle shifts, all of it. But if I look at that opportunity as a challenge and I'm fearful of that, then I can't get to that next level. So I think it's really important to know that money does not fix the inner. It's the inner that fixes the money, if that makes sense. Yes. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I I love that, that way that you're looking at that. Um, I I think that fear and lack and look, it's all fear, everything, whatever, whatever it is that we're talking about, we could call it stress. We could call it, call it anxiety. We can call whatever, but it's, it's all fear is what it is. It's just more comforting. It's more socially acceptable to say, I'm a little stressed right now. I'd rather say, I'm afraid, you know, I'm feeling fear, yes. but this is just a part of the human condition. Mm-hmm. And it's not something that's going to go away mm-hmm. when you reach a certain income level mm-hmm. it, be, because it just, it just won't. And, and our mind is wired to protect us. Our mind mm-hmm. is wired to look for problems, look for challenges. I had a realization a couple, oh, this was 2018. Um, are you familiar with James Wedmore and, and yeah. his work? Yeah. I love James Wedmore. He's great. So I was yeah. listening to his podcast, which was in 2018. This was a week where everything was going wrong. You know, everything mm-hmm. was going wrong. Now I, I did, you know, I think our physical body affects our emotions so much. Oh, so I had pneumonia at this time. It was the oh. most sick I'd ever been. Uh, still is the most sick I'd ever, I even had, I had COVID really bad and pneumonia was way worse. When I had pneumonia, oh. that, that was way worse. And um, so I was very sick and I was, mm-hmm. with that being said, there was all this stress and stuff that was going on. And, and he made a point that has stuck with me so much since then. And I wonder if you'll relate with this. I, I assume you will. But what he said was, is we think that it's the stress. We think that it's the thing. We think it's the thing that we're stressed about. And he says, think about something that you're either stressed about now or, or have been stressed about in the past. And let's, I think it was that. So let's look at something you've been stressed about in the past. And when you were in that high stress moment, has there ever been a time where you solved that problem And then your mind immediately went to the next thing to be stressed about. Mm. And if you immediately went to the next thing is stressed about, and that thing's just as big, how weird is it that that thing that you're now just as stressed about, you were not thinking about it when it was number two, when it was number two, you weren't even thinking about it. And so therefore none of it's real. It's not Mm. real. And, uh, but yeah, I just think it's a part of the human condition and, and, this is who we are. This is who we are as humans. And we get to play with it and use it and, and experience things. Absolutely. And I think to not judging ourselves for being fearful and actually not pushing away the fear, right. Is actually like acknowledging it and being like, okay, I am instead of like pushing it away as well is like important to then like shift. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah. So I keep going. Some, Sometimes, um, I think we are unaware, even maybe even like before that of what you were just talking about, sometimes the lack of awareness of like what we're stressed about. I don't know if you ever feel like that, but there have been times in my life and even weeks, you know, that where I'm not even sure what I'm stressed about because I haven't gotten quiet enough to be like, what is that one thing that I'm stressed about? Right. And so like getting quiet will help us figure it out. hundred percent. Before we started recording, you mentioned a statistic and it said only 2% of the, 
of female entrepreneurs make it to that seven figure level. I don't know what it is for collectively or what it is for male Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, but you mentioned that quote. Why, why do you think that is? And what do you think that you have done differently? That's got you there. Mm. Oh gosh. I think what's got me there is the belief and worthiness work. So belief comes first is saying, okay, out loud, I believe I can do this. Next up is I'm worth it. I'm worthy of hitting seven figures. But then the third step is I deserve it and I own Mm. it. And so most of us will say, I believe, and maybe not even say, I believe it or I'm worth it or I deserve it. But there is kind of this, this growth into calling your shot kind of. And it's, it's a lot of that subconscious work. I, I call her the biatch in the back. Who's like running the show and being like, you don't deserve it. You are unworthy because maybe you were um, bullied as a kid when you were five years old. And that is imprinted on us that we don't deserve good things. Or maybe when we were usually these imprintations of our belief happen, you know, in our childhood, or maybe, you know, I watched my dad as an entrepreneur through the 2008 crash. And so maybe I believe because he and his business weren't as successful as he wanted. And he was always stressed about money in his business that I believed I needed to be too, which definitely was a thing before I did that work. Sure. So there's kind of three different levels to that. And I think that's what I did differently is worked on that belief and mindset work. Um, And then I do the scary things. When I invested in getting in the biggest room I'd ever been in last year, again, it's one of my biggest mentors of my business, Chris Harder. And he, um, his mastermind was $35,000. And everyone who was in his mastermind had been in business for years. They were in their mid thirties to forties and they were crushing it. The minimum to get in was having a $500,000 basically run rate. I'd only been at business for six months. I'd made about $300,000 in that six months. So I just made it in. I was the youngest person. I was 29 years old and I had the youngest business. And so I called my shot at the beginning of last year and said, I'm going to be a seven figure entrepreneur And then I took action on that. I actually invested in the $35,000 mastermind to put myself in the room and fully call my shot in front of my peers. And I felt so nauseous. I mean, I literally remember writing that wire, handwriting that wire and being like, oh my God, I have $40,000 in my bank account and I'm about to spend 35 grand in it to call my shot, get in the room and freaking kill it. And then I got there and I was like, oh my God, all of, it seemed like all of the belief work I had done had unraveled. There were Uh, so many limiting beliefs came coming up. I felt like crap pretty much the whole week. And then I got home and I was like, well, new levels, new devils. I've got a crap ton of work to do. And I did that in their work. That's amazing. Tell me a little more about going into that room and all of a sudden those beliefs coming up. What what is it that came up at that time? Well, it's funny. I think when you put yourself and I'm I'm speaking for myself, but maybe your listeners as well, or maybe even you, this is just what happens is like yes. we we put ourselves in rooms many times where we're gonna crush it in that room. Yes. And that it's scary to be in rooms where we don't belong or possibly like that we haven't hit that, or we're not the highest earner, the mid earner. It's hard to put yourself in the room when you are the low man on the totem pole. And so that's what I did. I was like, am I going to regret not doing this? Or am I going to regret doing this? And that's a question that I ask myself when I'm doing scary things, things that make me feel really nauseous to do (laughs) is I'm, if I, am I going to regret doing this or am I going to regret not doing this? Yes. And so I got in that Yeah. I was just going to say, I think it's so important that we purposely put ourselves in places where we're not the smartest person in the room. Yes. 
Yeah. And I think that's where the most growth happens. So like, while it was really uncomfortable, um, you know, I had been hitting 30, 40, 50 K months. The next month I had a 65 K month. The next month I had a 95 K month. And the next month I had a 125 K month. Mm. That's amazing. So not only, yeah, not only did I feel better, but I had huge ROI from investing in that and putting myself in the really scary room. Cause I looked to the girl behind me, um, Natalia Benson. She's a, a woman who talks a lot about money and is a mystical in this space. And she was like, I just had my first six figure month. And I looked at her and I was like, well, I'm going to have my first six figure month. And it only took yes. two months. Yes. Yes. That's incredible. I, I, I love that. Um, I'm curious as you had this quick growth, what challenges came up that you did not expect? Maybe logistical mm-hmm. challenges, maybe, you know, I don't know what it is, but what kind of challenges came up that you didn't see coming, but they came because of the growth. They came because of, okay, there's, we're expanding at this level. What kind of challenges uh, arrived that you just didn't see beforehand? Mm, from going from multi six to seven in that time span? Yeah, I mean, and in all honesty, you also went from zero to 40 a month in, in a month. I mean, so there can be in, in any of that journey, we're talking about a 16 month journey. So I'm curious about those different challenges that came up in, in that time. So for me, it was identity and I, you know, was a registered dietitian for eight years and I loved fixing people's guts. I'm really good at it. I'm still great at it, but it didn't feel good to me anymore to be doing that one-to-one. Um, and so the identity of moving into being a business coach, and then honestly, in the last three months of moving into being really a CEO and not Mm. being the person who's coaching much anymore, um, one-to-one and letting go of a lot, you know, I let go of a group coaching program where I was teaching people how to make their first six figures. I let go of that because that was out of alignment. Um, I introduced a new company. So then I had to move into the CEO. So for me, the biggest challenge was the identity shift of who am I? Am I doing this wrong? Because now I'm, my biggest title isn't the thing that I went to school for. I think maybe your audience can relate is like, we're taught like the smart thing to do is do the thing that we went to school for. But like, we choose that when we're 18 years old. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's ridiculous. The whole thing is ridiculous. The, 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 the whole thing is silly. We can get a yeah. whole other conversation about that, about school. And, and you don't know my background, but me and school growing up, we're not the best of friends. And um, so I'm, I'm all in with you on that. And I think that there's so many limitations and things that we need to unlearn. Mm-hmm. Like not, not things we need to learn, things we had to unlearn. Mm-hmm. What are some examples for you of things you, not that you needed to learn on this journey, but you needed to unlearn to be able to keep growing and growing and moving forward. Mm. Oh, golly. So the one thing that I needed to unlearn was that I was not deserving of having what mm. I wanted. Oh, this is a good one. That if I want nice things or I make a shit ton of money, that that means something negative about me. Oh gosh. Yes. Oh, because when you're making a lot of money and as a business coach, I put my numbers out there on Instagram, but I didn't always. And I was fearful of judgment and I had to unlearn that one judgment of myself and judgment from others was an important thing. Mm. that other's perception of me, I needed to unlearn that it really didn't matter. And actually it's a reflection on them and what their limiting beliefs are, because I am, you know, a very heart centered person. You know what I mean? I love people. I love life more than anyone out there. And I, Mm. I, I lead with gratitude and all integrity and all these things. I can feel and that. thank you. And can I be a seven figure, eight figure, nine figure entrepreneur? Yeah. So 
it's almost like unlearning that making a lot of money or being wealthy meant anything negative. I had to completely unlearn that. What was the, when, when you were growing up and when you learned Mm -hmm. those things, if you were to complete the sentence of rich people are, Mm -hmm. what would come next? Not now, but back in those days. So that's a great question. Cause actually my mindset coach who I was working with, you know, before I started my business, she had that exact question on her questionnaire. And I would love to look back at what I said, but when I thought of rich people, I thought of my godfather Mm. and my godfather is actually the epitome of a very nice heart centered, rich person. Oh, great. And he was, yeah. And he was a big cheerleader in my life. He's actually an investor now in my company. He's in private equity, brilliant freaking guy. And so, um, that was my vision of a rich person, but on the other end of it, it was, um, more so like a lack of identity that I was a rich person or mm. could be, Um, because of my dad being an entrepreneur and going through the 2008 crash and losing a lot. So it's a little complicated, but I think I had this little bit of a dichotomy that I really believed rich people were great people and they were brilliant and heart centered and very giving. But then I also had this, um, belief that getting rich was not necessarily for me or getting rich, um, was hard. Ooh, that's yeah. a good one. I, I, I have an interesting, well, I think it's interesting, um, but I have an interesting theory about people in our age bracket. People in our age bracket, if you remember like every movie in the 90s, every movie. So I did some math when you said you're 29 to, you know, a year, you know, two years ago. So you're 30, 31, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Every movie in the 90s and early 2000s, the villain was the wealthy person. <laughs> like, think about that. The, the villain person was not only was the villain the wealthy person, but also the villain was driven by money and mm-hmm. the hero didn't care about money. They cared about people. And mm-hmm. these two things were seen as, as opposite not as the same. They were seen as opposite. The media that we grew up watching presented it in that way, which is funny because obviously the reason they're making the movies is to make money and all that kind of thing. But the, these, the media that we watch, and I think that so much of the um, mindset that millennials have around money Mm -hmm. has to do with the media that we grew up watching. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Do you have a thought on that? I don't know if that's come up before or not, but oh my we watch music we listen to. Like, even if you think about it, the only music that talked positively about money was hip hop. That was like very far on the opposite side, very far on the bling and everything being so over the top. And it's like, well, I, that also was related with other things that, that, that just, wasn't what I wanted in my life it was you mm-hmm. know drugs and and crime and those kind of things and that's what what was presented and that was the only ones that talked about money in a positive way but all sorts of music talked about corruption and money being evil and then the 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 TV shows the movies I don't know what are your thoughts on that I mean I don't even think I've put that together truthfully it's interesting because I had a real life example of like a mobster. Like if we think about, oh gosh, there's got to be a movie somehow, but that like was selling drugs and making a lot of money. Um, my best friend growing up was very wealthy and we never knew why turns Mm -hmm. out two houses down for me. Her dad was selling cocaine our entire childhood. Wow. Wild. Um, so I don't, I mean, definitely subconsciously or unconsciously that affected me. Right. Cause Yeah, I do have, I did have this belief that, um, if I wanted more money and this happened for me, probably, you know, six months, 12 months into my business, it didn't really happen in the beginning because I wasn't also focused on that. And I've never really been ultra focused on it. It just felt like it happened truthfully. Like I had this, this goal of like, oh, I want to make a million in 18 months to show that one women can do it. And that two, I can do it. And 
it was never hyper, hyper focused on the money. Cause I think that's where sometimes fear can come in or lack, um, that we don't have enough, but I'm sure subconsciously or unconsciously that was in effect a thousand percent. Cause I'm deaf. I'm a nineties child. Yes. Yeah. And th- the reason why I brought that up was he said, well, actually I had really good connections with with people who are wealthy and say, well, interesting. So then where does that come from? If in my life I have those, I just think that and previous generations weren't the same. It wasn't the same. It wasn't always seen that way, but specifically our generation, the types of media was very focused on money equals bad. And if you're driven by money, it's bad. That Mm -hmm. is an evil thing. And the hero was always poor, but a good person. Mm-hmm. Right. And there was something noble about it. And I think that that, mm-hmm. that really hits us. Anyway, a couple other questions I had. Uh, first question, I have two questions on delegation. The first one is, what do you think is the first thing that somebody should delegate? What, what's the first thing? I don't, if someone has nothing delegated, what's their first step in delegation? Mm. Oh, golly, this is a great question. I think onboarding new clients is great delegation. You don't need to be talking contracts with your clients. You don't need to be talking invoices or following up with that. So I think like Mm. onboarding new clients or onboarding a new course or backend stuff. So there's, it's really important. I think in business and I don't, have you read the book traction? No, it sounds like a great book. Oh, it is so good. Rocket fuel. I would read first. It determines the same author, same author. Yep. Okay. Who is it? I Google knows. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, <laughs> oh gosh. I can't remember. It's like an Italian name. Um, it, it's this concept of a visionary and an integrator. Okay. So the visionary in the business is the one who's usually is the it, founder. Is it Gabriel Weinberg and Justin Mares? No. Okay. So there's another book called traction. Ooh, Different maybe. book. Well, okay. Is it get a grip on it? Traction, get a grip on it? Yeah. I think, I think traction, so. that's it. Okay. I think it's a popular book title. Traction. <laughs> traction is it. Okay. There you go. When he said it was an Italian name, I was like, well, that doesn't look like an Italian name. Gino Wickman. Is that who it is? Yep. That's who it is. Okay. There He's you go. Brilliant. Traction by Gino Wickman. I'll check it out. Yeah. And so it's this concept. So rocket fuel, I would read first and then traction. I'd read second, same guy, okay. Gino and rocket fuel is all about being a visionary or an integrator. And so we think about visionary. We typically think of that CEO role of the, I have a hundred ideas. I am the cheerleader of the team. I'm typically the founder. And then the integrator is the how person. And so if you don't know which you are, you need to figure that out first. If you're the founder of your company, because the integrator is the systems and the how for us as I say us as visionaries, because my, my guess is that you are as well. Like your energy is just visionary, right? We have Walt Disney on my wall, right? Yeah. That says everything it needs. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Right. And he was a huge visionary and he's actually talked about in the book. He didn't well, his know his brother that- was the integrator. His brother, who was his partner was the integrator, Roy. Yes, exactly. And so yeah. the how for you and I, the how bogs us down. We yeah. have a hundred ideas. Anxiety. Yes, exactly. But for the integrator, it is very exciting. It is. I love to tell us, we tell them the point B and they say, okay, here's where, what we need to do and how we need to get there. So mm. before you start delegating anything, you need to figure out, and this is a you for everyone listening is like, figure out if you're a visionary or integrator, because then you know what to delegate for me as a visionary onboarding systems processes. That's what I delegated first in client communication. Mm. And then what do you think is the most important, or what do you think was the, um, because one of the things you, you mentioned earlier, you said, look, when it came down to it, getting to that seven figure level for you, you, you really boiled it down to two, uh, three things. Yes, you did talk about the belief being worthy and deserving, but in terms of things that you did, mm-hmm. it when I guess that was in the mindset section, you said, okay, it was mindset, it was mm-hmm. network, and it was delegate. 
Mm -hmm. And I think we spend a lot of time on mindset, a lot of time on network. And so that delegate, I want to know what, what was the most important thing after you did that first simple things, Mm -hmm. those first things, what was it that, that was the most important in getting you to that seven figure level? Mm -hmm. So the most important, I think with hiring, what some people do is it's a checkbox. And they're like, I've hired my VA, check. They work for me 10 hours a week, check. That's it. I'm paying them whatever, $2,000 a month. That's what I need to do. What I did is said, what else do I need to delegate to this person? Can Mm. I make them full time? Or what else do I need to delegate like um, in my home? What else do I need to invest in? Yeah. So, you know, we hired a cleaner. (laughs) I'm glad you brought that up because so many people don't think about that. Like Mm -hmm. they don't think about home stuff. They just think about like, you you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mow my lawn. I'm not going to do the, the snow. Like I hired a guy every time it snows, he comes and does the thing. I'm not like, people are like, why do you do that? I'm like, I don't want to start my day like that. Like, I, I know that some people are saying that sounds ridiculous, but like, I, I, I don't want to do that. Like, it's just not, I just no. want it done. I just want it done. And delegating those things makes like, I remember when I had that idea of the snow, like that to me was like, I just felt so much better about mm. life. And I didn't have to, it was just something that wasn't on my list to do. And this, this is an important thing before you even delegate is getting into alignment, right? And we were talking about that before is like, it doesn't really matter if that sounds cuckoo to someone else, it's an alignment for you, you know, right. like hiring a cleaner for a house for us was in a lot of alignment. This is, this is the number one question I ask myself and have my clients ask themselves when they are trying to delegate, because it can feel hard we almost think of it as like giving away more money. Like, do I really need to do this? And the answer is some, most of the time, yes. But that can feel like fear, right? Or like giving away more money. So figure out your hourly rate. Hopefully, I think most people who are listening to this, if you're an entrepreneur, you know your hourly rate of what you charge. Then ask yourself, is cleaning your kitchen a $250 per hour task. Yeah. No. Definitely and it not. doesn't light you up. Okay. Delegate. Yeah. That, that's, that's a good way to put it though, because look, I, I know someone who does very well financially and he thoroughly enjoys his ride on his ride on lawnmower. And it's something that he enjoys doing. It's like, well, great. If you love it, awesome. But then I also know people who are lawyers with a you know five six hundred dollar billable hour, and are mowing the lawn to save money. And I go, mm-hmm. what are you doing? This doesn't make sense. Like this makes zero sense. Now for that other guy, if it's a stress relieving thing, and he mm-hmm. and he does, he likes. He likes the feeling of doing this. There's something Zen about it. I I don't know. It's what he likes. Cool. That's great. But if it doesn't light you up, why, why are you doing it? It doesn't make sense. Absolutely. There's like this four quadrant. And I think this might be in traction or maybe this is more global than that. Um, But there's this four quadrant um, activity that you can do. So the the upper left is I like to do it and I'm good at it. The, and then the catty corner to that is that I don't like to do it and I'm not good at it. And then, so as you can imagine, there are things that you're good at and that you don't do well. And then the fourth chord quadrant, maybe that's the upper right is that you do well, but you don't like. Mm. I hope I explained that well. Yep. And basically the goal of like up-leveling is doing things that you love and that you're good at. Yeah. Because you, 
we can bet that Jeff Bezos is not doing things that he's not good at or doesn't love. For sure. And that's one reason of his success, right? But we think, oh, I'm just a multi six figure entrepreneur. I don't deserve that. And then deservingness comes in again. Yes. Or like, I'm fearful. This is where just the mindset just comes in everywhere. It's like, I'm fearful of paying someone else to do it. So I'll just do it myself. Yes. I think that's so important. Um, just a couple last questions. I want to, I want to respect your time. Um, that, that first one is what you've reached this in a very short period of time, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. What is the thing that most people wouldn't think like they, they just wouldn't think is a part of the, the key to success. Like you go, okay, all these other things. Yeah, that makes sense. But is there something we go, you know, the real answer is what comes next? Being around super supportive people. I know we talked about network, but it really matters the people that you're around. You could join a mastermind and it could be competition. Yes, Instead right. Of collaboration, right. right? It needs to be a um, collaborative group. Collaborative cheers you on. I mean, you know, from this mastermind that I joined with Chris last year, I found, you know, my bridesmaid who also happens to be like an eight figure entrepreneur and badass. So like finding the right people, not just finding people investing in the room and getting in the room with like people who are doing things bigger than you getting in the room with people that light you up. Mm. And so how do you find that? Find a coach who lights you up because they are going to attract and magnetize the same people. Mm. I love that so much. That's fantastic. And then what's the best, best way for people to, to find out more about you and what you do? Well, by Bridget on Instagram, that's where I hang out. Um, it's funny too. I, oh, I would love to say this to everyone. I hit seven figures with having under 3000 Instagram followers. Boom. That is awesome. And Boom. so excited because you are breaking limiting beliefs of I cannot do this until here or breaking limiting beliefs of, oh, that person can't be successful because I have more followers than them. And that's just so silly because you can't take followers to the bank. Absolutely. Yep. So while by Bridget on Instagram, I now have a whopping like 4,500 people, but you know what it is? Um, I, I joke about that because it truly doesn't matter like what you were saying. So yeah, go shoot me a DM. I, I love connection. I hope you guys feel that. I hope you feel that Jake. I just love sure. like connecting with people on a deeper level. I'm not here for the small talk, not here for pick your brain. I'm here for like that philosophical, like What's going on in your life? Let's talk about the real shit. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And then just last words of wisdom that you want to share for our listeners. Call your shot. If it's within you, it's for you. And you deserve to live every dream you could ever want. Mm, that's amazing. I love that. Bridget, thank you so much. We have a tradition here and that is that we end every single one of these interviews with a virtual fist bump. So put it up right here. You are awesome. Boom. Oh, there, oh, you there go. we go. Yeah, it's got to be on the camera. There you go. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something great out of it. And most importantly, I hope that you're going to implement something that you learned in this episode because nothing happens until you take action. If you're a six or seven figure entrepreneur who's looking to up level your network with a group of people, who also have a rising tide lifts all boats attitude, then come and join our exclusive network of successful entrepreneurs by going to mtmsuccess.com slash rising tide.